All right, well, we will go ahead and kick off the recording here. Um, so just to start with the intros, hey, I'm Jack Zamplin. I'm the product manager here at Cosmos Tendermint. Um, and this is the biweekly SDK community call. Uh, Aaron, do you want to go ahead and intro yourself next? Sure, I'm Aaron from, uh, I'm the CTO of Regen Network and um, we're building a zone on top of the Cosmos SDK to, dedicated towards uh, ecology. Nice. Mark? Sorry, I was on mute. No, no problem. Hey guys, this is uh, Mark. Um, I'm from Shapeshift and uh, Shapeshift is actively um, supporting the Cosmos ecosystem with a couple of different projects. And in this context, we're working on a decentralized Oracle that will run as a zone in the ecosystem and it will make data price data available for free for any DAP user that wants to use it. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Michelle? Hi, I'm Michelle, and I'm working on the public relations and developer relations team at Cosmos. Awesome. Bez? Yo, um, yeah, I'm Bez. It was nice meeting most of you in Berlin. Um, I work on the STK team, and I also work on Tendermint. So. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Rory? Hey everyone, uh, I'm from Kava. We're working on bringing DeFi to Cosmos. And uh, Jay Hernandez, is that Juan? Did I, am I like completely wrong on that? Yeah, um, yeah, my name is Jorge. I'm, I'm, Jorge. I am on the United team at True Story. Awesome, well thank you for joining us Jorge. All right, so uh, just to kick this off, I, I think maybe we should talk about the 036 release and then dive into the discussion on uh, supporting community projects and how to support folks upstreaming code into the SDK. Um, Bez, do you want to talk through, uh, I think I've got a list of the major features. Yeah. Do you want to talk through that list and then we can kind of question? Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Sure. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I think some of the biggest some of the biggest changes that we'll see coming in the um, 036 release of the SDK and coincidentally the uh, version one release of Gaia is most notably um, ABC events. So we kind of fundamentally change the way we index and allow developers and clients to emit, subscribe and query for transaction and, and block events. So that PR has been merged, and if you actually take a look at the, uh, each module's respective spec uh, directory in the docs folder of the SDK, you'll see all the uh, events emitted from every particular uh, module. So you'll be able to query for things like whenever a validator missed a block, or whenever a validator was slashed, or um, you know, distribution events, like when a validator received rewards or commission. Uh, things of that nature. So I think that's, that's pretty big. Another uh, thing coming out in this release is support for parameter change proposals. So, um, you know, we have a lot of on-chain parameters that kind of drive uh, and act as levers in the protocol. And we'll be able to change those on-chain um, through, through governance proposals. So those no longer require, um, you know, downtime and upgrades. That's pretty cool. We've also had, oh man, probably as a work in progress for nearly a month now, uh, a new supply module. So kind of just improving the way that we track various supply uh, supplies internally in the SDK. So I think this will not only improve developer ergonomics in the sense of other downstream developers being able to kind of implement uh, various supplies. So like, for example, like bonded supplies, unbonded supplies, uh, you know, fee pools, things of that nature. Uh, and that's pretty much wrapped up. That's almost going to get merged. Um, and then we have a bunch of simulator improvements as well. So, but uh, I think those three things are the, are the biggest things that come out of uh, this release. So out of those features, it, it sounds like the new supply module and the module pattern refactor are the two biggest impacts for projects building on top of yeah. Uh, and, and, and events, yeah, those are the three big ones. So like, you know, the, the, the supply module is really gonna give 
greater flexibility to developers to kind of ma manage um, various supplies internally. So before we use this, no <coughs> this notion of pools, which is very rigid and static and, and error prone. Um, and so now we kind of treat these, you know, internal pools as just regular accounts, but they're just, they're just treated specially in the SDK. So um, again, you know, things like where we collect the fees and uh, where we track bonded versus non-bonded. And you can even track things like vesting um, and things like that. So it really gives, I guess, a better or more freedom to developers to express and manage uh, various kinds of internal, you know, pools of funds. Um, and also, the, again, good, uh, I think the, uh, the module refactor that we, that we worked on, which I didn't touch on earlier, because um, it doesn't change the protocol, but it does improve developer ergonomics. Um, I think developers will find it easier to construct and build their applications and kind of, kind of uh, plug and play various modules in, the, in, a, in a more seamless fashion. Just circling back to the module accounts, uh, what are some examples of functionality that would be enabled by this refactor, maybe in the SDK, yeah. and then some potential other uses for that? Yeah, so one of the cool things with this is, you know, again, they're these, these kind of like internal pools or funds, if you want to call them, they're really just special accounts. So it's not, they're not really too different from, you know, accounts that you can transfer funds to. Uh, the cool thing is, with the first iteration, you know, I plan on kind of improving this, but right now it's a little limited, but the idea is you can essentially uh, set permissions on various kinds of, you know, module accounts. So for example, the minter, you know, that's where we mint, you know, inflate coins, we mint new tokens. Um, that has, that's a module account and that has permissions to do essentially one thing, uh, and that is mint coins. And if it tries to do anything else like burn coins or uh, send it to some non-valid address and that, that would be kind of an invalid action and so it doesn't have the permission to do that. So with this feature, developers can set permissions on various module accounts and they can set uh, what those permissions are allowed to do for respective, uh, respective accounts. Nice. Um, in the events PR, how does this impact existing SDK developers? Uh, so it impacts existing SDK developers twofold. Um, it allows them to essentially, it improves the ability to kind of compose and aggregate more complex queries. So for example, before this, uh, before this kind of fun new functionality, you weren't able to really emit things like slashing events because one, you know, event would override the previous, or we used to call them tags. So one tag would override the previous tag. And so you weren't really able to kind of expose and provide this rich uh, event data that kind of happens throughout the, the natural uh, life cycle of transactions and box. So with this new events uh, system, developers are essentially able to create as many events as they want without having you know, the worry of one overriding the other. And they can essentially expose to a much, much richer query and subscription uh, interface. Uh, so really it's up to them on how they wish to construct these events, but they can query for essentially anything they want. Thanks. Any questions about those features or any of the changes that we're making here? Because uh, you guys on this call are some of the developers who are gonna be most impacted by the changes in this release. I I've reached out to each of you all individually, specifically to talk about the module pattern refactor and, and how that's gonna improve your lives while causing some short-term pain. So just would love to get some feedback uh, on those changes that you've seen and, and any anything that you have there. Yeah, guys, um, I the, the the timing for this couldn't be better because I was actually just telling Jorge this morning that it'd be really awesome if modules had some kind of account. Um, so we we were just talking about cool. that. So it's, it's it's cool that you guys are are, are doing this. Uh, my question is, how does it expect namespacing? like in the Genesis files. So for example, mm -hmm. like, like, like we have our own staking module, which is staking on content, mm -hmm. right? And then the SDK has its own staking module. Um, and uh, can we maybe use like the account key or something like that as the identifier for that, for that module? So there's no, no, mm -hmm. uh, no conflicts. Yeah. So the way we're, the way we currently handle these kind of special module accounts, uh, is that in Genesis, they're just traditional, regular kind of accounts. 
but they have two additional properties. And one of them is a name and the other one is permission. Well, it will be a set of permissions, but right now it's a single permission. Uh, and based on that name, that kind of signals to the application that, hey, this is a special account and the special account has a certain permission or set of permissions. So within your special staking module, you can, for example, uh, use this special account but based on its name, you know, whether it be a constant or a parameter or whatever, and, um, you know, perform their business logic based on that. And that's kind of the way we do it within Gaia, right? So like we have uh, a minter uh, module account, we, we have a, uh, a fee distribution or fee pool, and then we have a bonded and not bonded uh, module account. So you can do something similar in your staking module. Okay, but the name is still is still just uh, just a string. The right? name is a string. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I I mean I, I I was thinking wouldn't it be cool if there was something kind of like Go imports where it's like a fully qualified name, mm -hmm. so there's no, no conflicts and stuff like that. Like, what do you guys think about that? Um, maybe we can like discuss that. Uh, I, I guess I would need more context to to really see. Uh, what you're, what you're okay. propo proposing there. Yeah, and I, 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 I kind of have to look at the account stuff yeah. and, and see how that works. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, again, this is kind of like a first iteration of it. Like I already, you know, I already have ideas on how to improve it, improve it because right now it, the permissions are fairly limited, uh, limited and, and kind of fixed, right? So you can like burn coins, make coins and just transfer. But you know, various application developers, they have all sorts of different permissions uh, outside of just minting and burning and you know, I want, uh, you guys to have the ability to set arbitrary amounts of permissions on these module accounts. And those permissions can do arbitrary, you know, uh, chunks of business logic. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, Rory, uh, for you guys as well, I would imagine this module accounts feature is, is probably going to be something that you're interested in. Have you looked into that code at all? Um, I haven't looked into it fully, but yeah, it's definitely something we're Going to be looking at more closely. Cool. Um, I had one question about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how how closely do module accounts interoperate with normal normal accounts? And for example, a, do you yeah. have kind of mm -hmm. just a normal transfer? From yeah. So to it it they they uh, operate with regular accounts in a very limited capacity. So uh, only around areas in the code where module accounts are actually needed, do they uh, operate with regular accounts? And again, this ties back into the notion of permissions. So for example, uh, when uh, at the end of every block, we distribute rewards to validators, you know, those funds come from the minting, uh, the minting module account, right? And those get transferred from that module account to actual, you know, validators. So that goes from, a, you know, an internal pool to actual addresses. But because that module account has permission to do so, it's able to send from a module account to a regular account. But based on those permissions, you may not able, be able to do that. So it's very granular in that sense. So you kind of define what you allow and what you don't allow. Okay. Um, I, I, I have a question about this. So, so how mm -hmm. does this fit into the OCAPS kind of uh, architecture um, mm -hmm. with like store keys and stuff like that? Does, does any of that change? There's, there's no, yeah, there's no, no, it's not really correlated to kind of that general OCAP design. Um, the only kind of OCAP, you know, paradigm we have here is just the permission layer, which is just checked, you know, like in the actual uh, lot, like for example, in the mint, in the minting, it says, you know, does this module account have permissions to mint? If so, do it. If not, return an error or panic. Uh, and that's pretty much it at the moment. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Any other questions about <coughs> O36 changes? Uh, very excited to get that shipped here and looking forward to upgrading the hub to that as well. One just uh, logistical question is when. Um, you know, when can we expect that merge? And is the is the um, PR branches that we did against master? If I wanted to start developing off of that, because you, you mentioned that to me in a Telegram. 
Yeah, I, I think I would ref defer to Bez on this one, but I think we're talking about, uh, I know we probably want to avoid cutting Friday releases. <laughs> I think uh, probably tomorrow or Monday, if I had to guess. This is uh, in regards to the uh, module account, the supply module, right? O36 final. Or O36 oh, the final. Final. oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so as far as O36, I mean, we're literally just waiting on two PRs at this moment. Uh, one's a spec and one's the actual supply module, which I gave a very thorough, thorough review on. I expect that to be wrapped up today, if not tomorrow. Um, so yeah, very, very soon, so. Okay. Let me also drop this PR in the chat so that you guys can track yeah. product there, but uh, that is uh, imminent. Cool, great. And that's PR uh, 4255 for those interested. Yeah, it's, it's pretty large, so don't, you know, don't be scared. It, it's, it's, uh, it's, I guess the bulk of the changes are, are pretty minimal, but it gives you a good understanding of kind of uh, design that we're heading headed towards. Yeah, the the PR has been open for around two months, <laughs> and most of the changes are uh, naming yeah. like, and like package renames and stuff. So uh, don't be intimidated by the large line count. There. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So uh, excellent discussion on that. Um, now I'd like to chat a little bit about supporting projects that are building on the SDK and how to bring that code. Aaron, I think that you were kind of leading that discussion um, in the in the Telegram channels earlier this week. Just wanted to give you a chance to kind of surface that and then have some time to chat about it with the group. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, in in the hackathon, we worked on a couple of uh, different functionalities. Uh, one is WebAssembly integration, and other is um, improved key management, which is in some ways a broad topic. We had some um, you know, solutions and there's other things being discussed. Uh, I'm having a conversation with uh, Bee Harvest. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, there's a discussion that ensued on Telegram or, and various channels, like how do we get these merged upstream? And these are things that involve, um, you know, there are people within, you know, uh, all in bits that are, you know, interested in these things. Uh, there are people in outside organizations, um, you know, our team and, and other teams that are, are interested in in working on these and so an idea on how to kind of collaborate is to um, you know basically create working groups or community groups uh, and so I created two community groups um, it's a model maybe we can replicate um, and, and the very basic just kind of setup I you know created for these is just creating a github organization and a telegram channel that are linked together um, and yeah I mean the, the idea is just like you know can we have these little sort of like um, focused, you know, groups that bring together, you know, people from, you know, from Tendermint, from Regen Network, from True Story, um, and and collaborate together on a solution that's something that, um, for a problem that, you know, people within the community are having across different projects. Um, and maybe there's a way that we, you know, centrally track these different groups. Maybe there's some, like, best practices. That's sort of the idea I have. Um, uh, you know, it's used in other areas, like for instance, uh, W3C does this to come up with standards. Um, they have working groups and interest groups and community groups and all that sort of stuff, so. Um, I don't know, guys, there might be a solution to this. Maybe we can uh, create a zone and uh, have governance for PRs and have it all stake-based, I don't know. <laughs> Just, yeah, throwing, just, just throwing, throwing that out there. <laughs> definitely an option. Rory, Bez, folks, anyone, anyone have any comments around, the, around this? Cricket. Think, thinking, I'm thinking. I mean, I think it's a fine idea. Um, I'm just curious how, uh, so are you thinking like something similar to like kind of like the IBC working groups that we have? Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, uh, to be honest, I haven't uh, been following that process too mm -hmm. closely. Maybe, and maybe I should be. Um, I, I just haven't known where to follow it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's working nicely for, for IBC as an not track. I mean, I think most of the discourse takes place in Telegram. 
Yeah, you know, <clears throat> actually, most of this course happens sort of asynchronously on GitHub issues for that group. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, there's sort of a code rep repository that they're collaborating over, which mm -hmm. is primary form of interaction. And then they do um, regular calls to sort of uh, help organize and ensure that the work is, we're not stepping on each other's feet. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe I, that's like, Maybe that's like what kind of these community calls can more or less uh, evolve into. Kind of hoping for that. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, I think it's great to yeah have have calls to like bring everybody together. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the idea is you know is maybe there's specific sort of topic groups that you know kind of form and coordinate around that, and then you know this community calls like the you know, everything coming together. Um, yeah. Maybe that's... Mm -hmm. uh, Do you think it would be helpful, like, for someone like me to kind of come jump in and help coordinate that? Um, you know, with, the, with like, key management and WASM? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I'm envisioning a world where there's, like, a key management group, a WASM group, there's a Bitcoin peg group, and a bonding curves group, and you know, how do we ensure that there's kind of a coherent view out of all of this stuff and, and that people are, you know, not over in a corner working on the same thing? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's sort of a, there's a big coordination problem and I, yeah, um, I think that would be great. I mean, from my perspective, uh, you know, I asked for, you know, like I asked for some early feedback just on some of the key management ideas because it affects the standard TX and yeah. the like. Yeah, I think it would be good if there's, you know, cross communication, the reason for sort of creating a separate organization in my mind, and maybe this is, you know, not the right approach, but the idea is that that makes it so that you can, you know, you can add people to the organization that's for that purpose, regardless of what other organizations they're part of. It's like, you don't have to be part of, uh, you know, all in bits, you don't have to be a part of regen. Um, uh, but, but then having that, you know, having you, you know, because you're upstream managing Cosmos SDK and, and sort of giving feedback like this is something that we, you know, doesn't, I see a design problem here or, you know. Um, yeah. Well, I think that anti-handler stuff that we were talking about yesterday is a great example of this. Like, how do we ensure that each of the different pieces understand how they all impact each other? Yeah, totally. Um, and some things might also be isolated. It might be that, you know, for instance, maybe it makes sense to even have like just a separate like you know cosm wasm organization just to like kind of manage like it's just a module maybe it doesn't even touch like the core things or maybe it does go into cosmos sdk that's something that you know i mean i think i think long term we do want to have a like a a you know a wide community kind of array of, of modules but yeah what 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 do we want into cosmos sdk you know as core um yeah, I think that that's a that's a broader discussion that we're kind of just starting to to have. Um, so, is the Wasm module a core SDK module? Like, I don't know. I think there's a pretty solid argument to be made for yes there, um, but yeah, I don't know. This was a we brought this topic up when we were in Berlin, Bez, and talked about which modules actually did want to get included in the SDK. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts or? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we did have that discussion in Berlin. I, I don't feel like we came to any kind of clear consensus. I mean, my, my general feeling and thought process around this is like anything that is like essentially tightly integrated or like integral uh, to building kind of like the base layer of an app should belong in the SDK. Uh, anything that like we kind of heavily oversee, maintain, or review should also probably be in the SDK. Um, but I, th I think it's a kind of a gray area. Um, and uh, I think it's kind of like a case by case basis. Something like Wasm, I mean, I think would, again, like the NFT is a good example. Like the NFT isn't used by Gaia, but um, there's a good chance that actually it will be at some point merged in the SDK. And I think the kind of similar notion applies to, uh, to, the, to the cause and loss. So, yeah. 
Cosmo Wazov, don't say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I'm curious to what other people think. Like, yeah. uh, should like nothing be in the SDK? It should all just be pulled from separate repositories? I mean, that's also an option. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Shane, how do you feel about that? I, you guys are developing um, in yeah, the I mean, now, so. Yeah, I mean, we're getting to the point where there could be things in the SDK uh, that are not uh, part of Gaia, right? Mm -hmm, and yeah. there's, there's all these other projects that are building on it. So should the SDK's purpose be to serve Gaia or serve um, all the ecosystem of, of projects, right? Um, and maybe there could be like some kind of rule that like everything that gets in the SDK has to go through some kind of, some kind of audit and mm -hmm. Um, things that are haven't gone through that audit yet kind of sit um, is managed by a third party. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, the SDK is kind of I I think going to be growing bigger than than Gaia, and there maybe needs yeah. to be some kind of process to figure out which modules get in and which don't. Yeah, but I don't know exactly what that is yet. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing in, in, I mean, of the things that we're working on, one thing that I would like to see, you know, maybe highest party merged upstream is, is the key management stuff. Because in my mind, you know, more so than, than WebAssembly, you know, some zones may decide they want, you know, WebAssembly contracts, some zones may decide not. I mean, but key management in my mind is something that enhances usability across, um, you know, if users have easier time managing keys across zones, it just helps adoption of everything. Totally agree. Um, and maybe even different, you know, beyond just the key management stuff we've talked about, there's different types of keys like, um, you know, secure enclaves on phones and, you know, more and more stuff we may want to try to uh, do to make it easier for people to build applications. And in my mind, that, that stuff going at the core layers is important. And, you know, a discussion I had at a at the hackathon with, with Pedro, who uh, works in Wallet Connect for Ethereum, is that like Ethereum didn't make some core protocol level things to help key management, and that's a big barrier to adoption. And if yeah. you know, mm. core level, it helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it, it sounds like there's just ongoing work and continuing discussion required here. So let's just keep these discussions going and. Um, obviously, Aaron, I'm available to <laughs> try to help out here. So uh, let's uh, let's keep working on that. Um, all right. Uh, finally, does anyone have any feedback for us? Any particular pain points that they're running into? Any issues that they want to highlight? Um, something that would help me a lot would be uh, some scripts that automate uh, creation of a test net. Um, so it's like set up oh. for valid for validators and do all that we stuff. Have, we already have that. You make local net start. Yeah. Uh, no, not not local net. Like like actual for for nodes. Oh. Uh, like on Amazon or something. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> we, we do have some existing Ansible and Terraform scripts um, in the repo right now um, that might be able to work, but you're thinking of sort of like something separate that you could pull in that works for an arbitrary SDK binary that you have locally? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, like a, like a generic version of the Ansible scripts and Terraform scripts that you guys have right now. I think the challenge there is that, you know, not every chain uses the same bootstrapping logic. Right, yeah. Um, but the thing is, even uh, I, I was looking at those scripts. Like, are they up to date with the current version of, of Gaia? Uh, no, that's something Mercha has been has had on his plate for a little while and hasn't picked up lately. I, I can see if he can refresh those and potentially work with you guys to generalize them. Yeah, because because uh, if those are up to date with Gaia, then I can just fork those and work on those. Um, okay. Yeah, for our specific case. Awesome. That's a great feature request, Shane. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Well, I'll see what we can do there. Uh, Bri, Kava, how are you guys doing? Anything that you're running into that's painful right now? Um, we've been busy kind of setting up test nets and things right now. And um, it's going okay. I owe you guys a few Yeah. 
yeah, there's nothing, uh, nothing I'd say that's terribly, terribly big pain point. Um, I guess setting up a testament is sometimes a bit uh, confusing at first. Um, things like uh, if you're changing the coin denominations, then uh, like <clears throat> you have to parse the Genesis file and kind of change things out there. Um, like nothing's terribly hard. It's just sometimes a bit confusing at first. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Mark, any uh, any feedback for us today? Uh, no, we've been pretty self-contained, and I think um, awesome. our path to actually deploying a test net is pretty straightforward at this point. So. Killer. Yep. All right. Well, uh, talk to everyone in a couple of weeks, and uh, if you have any issues in the interim, please reach out. Uh, you know where to find me. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Zach. All right. Bye, guys. Thanks, guys. Later, Bye. everybody.